everyone for coming, taking your time uh, to listen to this talk. Uh, this is on Franz Brentano and how he thought that psychology has an impact on philosophy. Now, uh, psychological considerations about the human mind have always played an important role in philosophy. But Brentano, so just think of uh, the British empiricists, how much psychology there is in Hume, for instance, or in Locke, or also Locke had his own theory of perception. So all these great philosophers of the past were uh, also very much interested in issues of uh, psychology. But Brentano didn't think of this only as a historic effect. Uh, he saw it. Uh, uh, he put another emphasis. Uh, on this historic effect, he thought uh, that this fact might in fact explain why philosophy for him was on a decline for many centuries since uh, uh, the early 17th century, since uh, Descartes. Uh, so he thought that psychology uh, didn't only actually have an impact on philosophy, that, but that it should in the future have a much stronger impact and that in fact only by uh, turning to psychology, philosophy could hope to, uh, uh, a certain renewal in philosophy could take place. So you have to think in this spirit of his masterwork of the psychology of empirical standpoint that he published in 1874 and also his famous intentionality thesis. Brentano saw that as, as a prime example how psychology could help both logic, but also ethics, aesthetics, and epistemology. Now, from a contemporary point of view, there's something very strange and awkward about that. Because we do not think of the intentionality, intentionality thesis, that mental acts are directed as objects, uh, as a uh, as a claim or uh, insight of psychology. That's a straightforward philosophical uh, claim that uh, people make now about the representation of nature, uh, nature of mental states. And in the meantime, psychology holds uh, positions that are completely in conflict with Brentano. So no psychologist today would, for instance, say that uh, the study of mental phenomena should be restricted to phenomena that occur in consciousness and uh, uh, no psychologist would also to think that uh, the fundamental truths in psychology can be gained uh, by inner experience only. So this is why we need a kind of re-evaluation if you want to engage with Brentano today not only from the historical perspective and that's the kind of re-evaluation re that I will offer you uh, today. So, I'll, so here's the outline of the talk. I'll begin by summarizing some of the big claims that Brentano makes about the impact of psychology on philosophy. Then I uh, remind you that there are two kinds of psychology in Brentano that he distinguishes, that he had a very specific view on the nature of what he called descriptive psychology. Uh, and then I'll emphasize two important theses that are part of his conception of descriptive psychology, namely what I call an independence thesis and a modal thesis. Uh, these are important claims because they will directly lead us to the kind of psychologism that Brentano advocated. Uh, and that was an accusation that played an enormous role role in the 19th century in German-speaking philosophy, uh, but Brentano thought of his own psychologist, uh, psychologism as being completely innocent. So I look at how he defended his brand of psychologism against uh, his critics. Well, and then uh, I give you my own critical assessment. I think that uh, Brentano very much overstated his case, so I think there is a grand illusion and a big surprise uh, that I will give you at this, uh, at the end of the paper. Uh, but I'll end with a kind of positive outlook that I think uh, that I will hold on to the claim that was so important for Brentano that psychology does have an impact uh, on 
philosophy, it's just that we have to see this whole in a more modest light. So I'll end with a positive outlook at the end then. So uh, here are three major claims that uh, Brentano uh, put on the table and that gave his whole philosophy a certain direction. Uh, early on in the psychology, in the first chapter, uh, Renato tells, tells us why he thinks that psychology is a science of outstanding importance. It's of outstanding importance, he says, because uh, it reveals the inner truth of the phenomena. Uh, it deals with phenomena that are extremely sublime, so there's the sublimity of these phenomena the special relationship these phenomena have to us and the practical importance of the laws which govern the mental phenomena. That's why psychology for him is a discipline of outstanding importance. Uh, but why does it have a special connection or a special importance for philosophy? Well, that's the second claim that he, you can read, for instance, in his uh, uh, first lecture when he came to Vienna in 1874, his introductory lecture über die Gründe der Entmutigung auf philosophischen Gebiete, uh, there he explained that he thinks progress in philosophy will depend on progress in psychology. And later on then, uh, in his very influential book on ethics, von Ursprung Sittlicher Erkenntnis, uh, he explains how new, uh, in, the, in, the, in the introduction, in the to this book, he explains how new insights into descriptive psychology will mark the beginning of a renewal in ethics, a new approach in ethics, but uh, more generally, a, re uh, a renewal in philosophy at all. So, his three kinds of mental phenomena the presentations, uh, the judgments, and uh, effective phenomena are related correspondingly to uh, aesthetics, to logic, and uh, to ethics, and he thought that in these three domains uh, uh, great new insights in philosophy can be expected just if we get the descriptive psychology right. So that's the kind of claims that Brentano made. Now to understand these claims, we have to take into account that Brentano used the term psychology very broadly. Uh, so from 1889 on, that was the publication of his book on ethics, Brentano always emphasized strongly a methodological division within the study of mental phenomena between descriptive psychology and what he called genetic psychology. He used uh, different terms for these two branches, so sometimes he speaks of pure psychology and uh, of psychognostics, uh, and also uses the term phenomenology. So this descriptive branch of psychology has the following task. It describes fully the basic components out of which everything internally perceived by humans is composed. And it then describes or analyzes the ways in which these components can be connected. That's the job of descriptive psychology, how he explains it in one of his lectures uh, that he gave at the beginning of the 90s, 1890s. And he distinguishes this from what he calls sometimes genetic, mostly genetic psychology, but sometimes also physiological psychology or explanatory psychology. The task of that branch of psychology is to explore the conditions under which particular kinds of experiences arise. So it's about the genesis of this phenomenon. Uh, now let's put that in a, in a historical context. Uh, why, how did this distinction that Brentano emphasized so much uh, fit into, uh, into, the history, fits into, into the history of ideas? There are several hints that uh, this distinction that Brentano uh, uh, emphasized has historical ancestors. There is, for instance, a book on medieval logic that came out in 1852 by Gordon uh, that uh, explicitly discusses uh, uh, an aspect of medieval logic called definitio descriptiva. So one of the Brentano uh, historians that uh, worked 
very much on Brentano, Klaus Hedwig thinks that uh, this definition descriptiva might be a kind of uh, 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 source for Brentano's distinction. And in fact, we know that Brentano in his library had a copy of this book by Godin. Whether he also was aware that uh, the term beschreibende psychologie, so this is descriptive psychology in German, was already used by the German philosopher Jakob Friedrich Fries, for instance, in the book 1807. So the term was not an invention by Brentano. But most importantly, we know that Brentano was very closely uh, reading and uh, had a high opinion of John Stuart Mill's logic. And in John Stuart Mill's logic, you can read in in, uh, in section 7, for instance, uh, the following. The section has the title, The first step of inductive inquiry <coughs> is a mental analysis of complex phenomena into their elements. No more contemplation of the phenomena, uh, excuse me, that's a typo, no, no mere contemplation of the phenomena and partition of them by the intellect alone will of itself accomplish the end we have now in view namely to find out what phenomena are related to each other as causes and effects. Nevertheless, such a mental partition is an indispensable first step. So that's the basic idea of descriptive uh, uh, psychology, that before we want to explain the causes and effects of mental phenomena, that an inevitable, indispensable first step is that we understand the mental partition. We have to analyze the complex mental phenomena in their elements. Uh, so, Brindana could have found the idea of uh, this idea of descriptive psychology, for instance, here in Mill's logic. Now, what about uh, Brindana's contemporaries? There is an interesting passage in a book uh, that was published in 1921 by Emil Putitz called The Culture of the Present Time. Uh, in this book, Utitz uh, uh, makes the following claim. Uh, if we want to describe the actual content of our experiences and their way of appearing, all physiological and physical considerations about the causal stimulus need to be bracketed. The clearest expression of this principle can be found in a psychologist named Ewald Hering. He, namely Hering, thus became the founder of a truly descriptive psychology. So according to this historian, it was not Brentano that invented, uh, was the founder of descriptive psychology, it was a now pretty unknown psychologist, Ewald Herring. Uh, one of <coughs> Brentano's uh, students, uh, Oscar Krauss, heavily protested against this description he said that this is a complete misunderstanding and that, of course, not hearing was the founder of descriptive psychology, but our master, uh, Brentano. But it's a historical, uh, uh, still it's a historical fact that at the, at the same time, the very much similar ideas was floating around and that Brentano was not the only one who had that idea. Or take Hermann Lotze. Uh, in his lectures on the Grundzüge der Psychologie, uh, Lotze dis distinguishes three kinds of psychology. There is descriptive or empirical psychology, there is explanatory, mechanical or metaphysical psychology, excuse the typos again, and there's a third branch of psychology that uh, Lotze calls ideal or speculative psychology. Or I consider Wilhelm Dilthe's uh, essay published in 1894, about the Ideen über eine beschreibende, so ideas about the descriptive or dissecting psychology. So what I want to uh, illustrate with this example is that it was not a very original idea that Brentano had here. It was an idea that was apparently floating around over the place. Of course, it could be that Lotze and Wilde were all influenced by Brentano and that even uh, Herring uh, knew about uh, about this from Brentano, but uh, this is unlikely. It, more, it, it seems that the idea was just in the air, as one as one puts it. But that doesn't mean that there is nothing original in the idea, because when we then uh, look closer into what exactly descriptive psychology means for Brentano, 
we see that, uh, as I put it here, Brentano put his own stamp on this common theme. Uh, so he didn't mean exactly the same thing as the, uh, with descriptive psychology that, for instance, Lotze meant or that Dilbein meant. There are uh, important differences, and there have been people working on this and point out these important differences. Uh, but I don't want to go into this debate now, I just want to look now what was exactly Brentano's view on descriptive psychology. So, uh, and I do, to do this now in two stages. First, what we find in the, uh, in the book from 1874, the descriptive psychology, and what we then find later on in his, in his lectures. Now, the editor of the psychology of the psychology, I mentioned him already, Oscar Krauss. He very much insists in the introduction to this book and in many footnotes that this distinction between descriptive and genetic uh, psychology is already implicitly drawn uh, in this early book. Uh, the terms do not occur in the psychology from 1874, so it's implicitly there. Uh, so where, where do we find this idea in the in the, in, the, in the empirical psychology of Brentano. Well, at the, at the very beginning, and this tells us what Brentano's concern was when he wrote this book, uh, we find the following interesting remark. There he says, let us not then be unduly disturbed by the inevitable encroachment of physiology upon psychology and vice versa. So why did he make this remark? I think the historical circumstances is that uh, people thought uh, psychology will now become uh, a new science by uh, heavily investing into physiology. So physiological psychology was supposed to be the great new uh, invention of the time. Uh, and Brentano says, uh, let's, let's not be unduly disturbed by that. Uh, there will be uh, an important connection between physiology and psychology. So the people coming from medicine, for instance, they will uh, work on psychological <coughs> themes. This will not lead to any kind of uh, reduction or, uh, uh, or threatening to psychology as a self-standing discipline. So the idea that uh, Brindano then gives us here is that there are overlaps. Psychology is a, is a science that overlaps with physiology, hence with the natural sciences. Psychology also, also overlaps with the humanities, particularly with philosophy. And the general theme that he uh, develops is that psychology is a relatively complex science, and more complex sciences depend on simpler ones. If you want to have this as an image, this might be the image. So there are the natural sciences, including physiology, that overlap with the triangle, that is psychology, it's not very readable, I'm sorry. And then uh, the diamond represents here in this picture the humanities, including philosophy. So psychology is in the middle, there's an overlap to the natural sciences at the bottom, and there's an overlap to the more complex disciplines uh, uh, in the humanities. So there is this kind of hierarchy or pyramid of sciences. Is the, is the diamond touching the, the circle or not? No. <laughs> is that a problem? Uh, no, this one place. Yeah. There's a gap here that needs to be bridged. So there's something to do here for psychology. Uh, so it, this is just the image for you to keep that image in mind. Now, there are two important things uh, that Brentano added later on. Uh, that are not uh, fully explicit, or perhaps not even implicit yet, in the, uh, uh, in the empirical psychology. So when you read the introduction to the Ursprünge uh, Sittliche Erkenntnis, his books on, on ethics that came out in 1889, uh, Brennano said, it has now been a long time since I have, since I have been uh, published something. It has been 15 years. But as you can see, I haven't been idle. Uh, I've been developing uh, a new uh, 
I've kept developing my ideas on psychology in the direction of a descriptive psychology. And now he emphasizes very strongly that this descriptive psychology does not depend on the natural sciences. So in the previous picture you remember that we had this kind of dependence on the, uh, on the bottom. Now he emphasizes what I mean by descriptive psychology. This is independent from the natural sciences. Why? Well, here are the reasons. Uh, descriptive psychology only deals with phenomena that are experienced in, in a consciousness. It does not deal with physiological processes that are not experienced in consciousness. When we do descriptive psychology, we can, so to speak, completely bracket the external world. That's the term that Husserl then will later use, the bracketing. This means also uh, uh, bracketing or disregarding what goes on in our body or the physiology. Therefore, this psychology is pure. Uh, what we then uh, focus on are mental phenomena that are accessible by inner consciousness and they form a distinct ontological category. Therefore, Brentano is a dualist. And then there are the complicated case of physical phenomena that somehow also occur in consciousness but that are not mental but physical. Uh, and they have formed here a, uh, a borderline case and, this, and, and, and raise a certain problematic. Uh, because being physical, you would expect that they are studied by physiological methods. But Brentano, I think, uh, uh, considered those phenomena to be the content of an experience that is given in inner consciousness, so that there is also a kind of way of integrating this physical phenomena into the analysis that can be carried out independently of considering the causal ancestry of those phenomena. So when you study sensations, you will uh, include into your study the content of the experience, for instance, a certain taste or a certain, uh, uh, or the colors or the, the sounds that we experience. They are physical phenomena, but we can study those phenomena independently of asking what the causal origin of these phenomena is. Because the question for the, the causal origins, that's something that is left for genetic psychology to study. So this is the independence claim, uh, which uh, will become important then when we then consider how what the kind of role that psychology plays for, for philosophy. So then genetic psychology is a part of natural science, or is the type uh, of psychology not there? So I, I, I think the way you can see it is that genetic philosophy would be in this overlapping area where the triangle overlaps with the circuit and uh, descriptive psychology would then be the upper part of the pyramid, which is, does not overlap with the natural sciences. So the triangle is then is now cut into two halves. The lower part of the triangle, that's the genetic psychology, uh, that has to <coughs> uh, take into account these encroachments, this overlap with the natural sciences, and then you have the, the pyramid above the circuit, part of the pyramid above the circuit, this is pure descriptive psychology. And there comes then the important overlap with the, with the humanities. Uh, so this is how far you get with, the, with, the, with this idea of independence. But then Quintano adds something important, and this is an even stronger claim, or a more, more challenging claim, I call it the modal thesis. So what, what, what do I mean by that? Uh, in his lectures on descriptive psychology, uh, Bredano sets out the kind of methodology that the descriptive psychologist or the phenomenologist uses. Uh, so he says, when we con consider the descriptive psychology from its epistemological or methodological as uh, uh, aspect, we see that it is an exact science. Uh, so when he compares descriptive psychology with, with other uh, classificatory disciplines, for instance with uh, anatomy, uh, the science that deals with the various parts of our body, uh, there is a dissimilarity here because uh, anatomy isn't an exact science. 
it's a straightforward empirical science that tells us what kinds of parts we find in our body, and it only gives us what Brentano says are esoteric truths. So every human body, normal human body, contains one heart and two kidneys. That's just a straightforward uh, empirical claim, and there is no necessity in it. There's no necessity in it. The human bodies could change in such a way that then in a normal human body you uh, find only one kidney or two hearts. Uh, uh, nature could have reduced our bodies in a different way. So in descriptive psychology, it's different. There we find apodictic truths, so truths that, are, that hold with a modal force, that hold with necessity. So how is that possible? Well, here's how Brentano explains it. And you will notice that there are certain similarities with the quotation from John Stuart Mill here. So Mill also would say, when we consider our experiences, we see that they are not what uh, philosophers uh, have called clear and distinct ideas. Our experiences are somehow blurred and therefore need to be analyzed. Particularly the complex ones, we don't immediately see how complex what their parts are. So some work has to be done to analyze experiences. Once we do this work, this work of anal anal analyzing or dissecting the, com the complex phenomena, uh, we discover certain common features. So we discover, for instance, and this now gets us to the intentionality doctrine, that experience have an act com uh, a structure, an act content structure. We discover that in the experience we find primary and secondary objects, and all these things are uncovered by the, by this analysis. Uh, we also then find out certain characteristic differences between certain basic categories of phenomena. So we now see that there is the category of presentations, so there is the category of judgments, and there is a third category of effective states. Uh, but so far, uh, we are dealing with these categories on the basis of what we discover in our own subjective experience. But once we have found out the structural features, uh, we can do more than this, just noticing these structural features as features that characterize our own experiences, we see that we can now generalize those features uh, and, for instance, then say that not only my own experience as, I, as it is given to me, but every experience in every other subject too will have the same kind of structures, an act content structure or primary and secondary objects. And then we can use something that Brentano calls here a priori induction that allow us, allows us to grasp the necessity in those generalizations. That these generalizations do not hold only as rhetorically or contingently, but with a necessity. Uh, and this is a very distinctive uh, achievement uh, that sets descriptive psychology, for instance, apart from uh, yeah, anatomy, but also uh, uh, geology, for instance, uh, that just describes the kinds of minerals that you find uh, contingently on our planet. It doesn't give us necessary truths. Descriptive psychology gives us necessary truths. So I think that people and his students that uh, attended those lectures, they had a good reason kind of thinking that what Brentano now was advocating was what other people have called psychologism. Uh, very apparently, the position that Brentano now holds here is a form of psychologism. Now, the debate didn't start with Brentano. That's again a, a historical uh, observation that I'm uh, adding here to the story. So the, the debate about psychologism was uh, raging on in German philosophies since uh, 1866 at least, when some Johann Eduard uh, uh, when a philosopher called Johann Eduard Erdmann 
uh, introduced this uh, term psychologism and applied it to a view that uh, um, Friedrich Eduard Benecke, Benecke already published in 1833. So in Benecke you can find the following two, two views. Well, Benecke said already that philosophy, if philosophy wants to be the highest science, the science of the sciences, it must rely on the reality which is given to philosophy, namely inner experience. So psychological knowledge is the central starting point, it is the basis of all other philosophical knowledge. So this is what German philosophers at the time meant by psychologism. I'm uh, drawing here on the a very uh, impressive study by Martin Kusch that documents that kind of uh, uh, debate in the 19th century, the case study in this sociology of philosophical knowledge. Now, there is no, no doubt here, it seems very clear that Brentano just uh, stands on the side of Benecke here. So here's, here are two quotes uh, from the first edition of the psychology and then from the supplement, supplementary remarks that Brentano added in the second edition in 1911 that more or less just say the same thing as Benedict said in 1833. Uh, so Brentano says, let me point out merely in passing that psychology contains the roots of aesthetics. Likewise, suffered it to say that the important art of logic also has psychology as its source and along with aesthetics and logic, ethics and politics also stem from the field of psychology. That's exactly what Benecke said. Psychological knowledge is the central starting point. It is the basis of all other philosophical knowledge. Uh, so when Brentano then was accused of just uh, uh, joining the camp of the uh, psychologists that have been so much criticized for that. Uh, he defended himself and uh, says in his in, in supplementary remarks, uh, I am so convinced of that uh, claim of it that it, for me it would be paradoxical or even absurd if someone denied that knowledge is judgment and that judgment belongs to the domain, domain of psychology. So what Brentano said in his reply was more or less, look, what I'm claiming here isn't controversial at all, it's obvious. Why all that fuss about psychologism? It's, it's just a plain truth and denying that would be paradoxical uh, and even absurd. But of course, that was a kind of uh, uh, trick that Brentano played. And in fact, uh, his real defense depended on his dis uh, distinction between descriptive and genetic distinction. He just doesn't make this uh, claim, doesn't explain it in his own sense. He, he makes this remark about, look, what I'm claiming is just uh, plainly obvious. It's not obvious. So his pupils then, but also Brentano, uh, put up the following real defense. And the real defense is this. We are not claiming, or Brentano, I am, or Brentano is not claiming that philosophy or the other humanities depend on genetic psychology. That would be this uh, uh, unacceptable, an, un, an unacceptable form of, uh, of psychologism. What we claim only is that philosophy or philosophical inquiry presupposes those apodictic valid generalizations that derived from inner experience by pure descriptive psychology. That's all that philosophy presupposes. So the accusations of psychologism are invalid or irrelevant because they disregard this distinction. That we are not claiming that, uh, that philosophy depends <coughs> on genetic psychology, it depends on natural sciences, but only on those apodictic truths that uh, result by, from generalizations in descriptive psychology. And then there is this uh, uh, remark that Brentano adds, and those who deny this are either ignorant 
or have extraordinarily poor memory. Now we can guess uh, whom he has in mind here. My guess is that uh, when he made this remark, uh, the person who, who had, he had in, must have had in mind was, <coughs> excuse me, uh, was Husserl. So Husserl in 1901 published uh, the Prolegomena, the first volume of his uh, logical investigations. A fierce attack on psychologism it doesn't mention Brentano at all, but mentions some of his pupils. So Husserl mentions, for instance, Höfler, he mentions Meinhof, those are the, the bad psychologists he's fighting. He doesn't mention Brentano, so Brentano also doesn't mention Husserl. Uh, but when Husserl attacks the Brentano students of being psychologists, yeah, he should have known better because Husserl was sitting in those lectures in Vienna that explained this difference between you know, genetic uh, uh, and descriptive psychology. So Husserl couldn't be excused for being ignorant. He can only be excused for having extraordinarily poor memory. But perhaps this is a, an overinterpretation, but that's a big, uh, what, uh, what you can read here between the lines. So this is the, the kind of, uh, as far as the discussion was, <coughs> was going in the beginning of the 20th century, uh, people accused Brentano as pupils of psychology, and that's the kind of defense that they put up, they put forward. How should we evaluate that today? Uh, and here comes now my critical assessment of this. Uh, I think there is in this defense that the, uh, that the Brentan, Brentanists uh, uh, put forward there is a big problem here. And the problem is that there is a step uh, which is overlooked or hidden in the argument. So there are uncont two uncontestable claims, namely that psychological processes are involved in the acquisition of knowledge. This is this obvious thing that Brentano was saying here. It's obvious that knowledge is judgment and that judgment belongs to the domain of psychology. Of course, in order to know something, you have to, to in order to acquire uh, knowledge, uh, you have to form a judgment, and judgment is a mental process. Uh, so you, are, you have to do something psycho psychologically uh, to know something. But the contestable claim is that psychological analysis is also needed for giving an adequate justification for your knowledge claims. So belief forming is a psychological process, but what about the justification? Uh, the contestable claim, I think, uh, requires here two additional premises, and both of these premises were uh, accepted by Brentano. And this is his foundationalist uh, position in epistemology, that all justification ultimately derives from the self-evidence of inner perception. So the, you have the truths of inner perception, they are self-evidently true, and they, those are your basic beliefs. And all the other justification for the rest of whatever you know about any other subject matter has ultimately derived from the self-evidence of inner perception. And this, uh, that's the first premise that's important here, and the second premise, without which the defense wouldn't work, is that the self-evidence of the judgments of inner perception, that's a property of judgment that you can analyze with the methods of descriptive psychology. Therefore, descriptive psychology is not only important for the acquisition of knowledge, but it's also important for uh, understanding how we get the justification of our claims to knowledge. Now, the title of Brentano's book was Psychology from an, from, an, from an Empirical Standpoint. And he very much emphasizes that the empirical basis for this psychology is a sort of experience, something empirical, namely in an experience. But now we are at a point where we get a certain surprise, namely that a strong rationali rationalistic theme comes into Brentano's 
so-called empirical psychology. There are a few passages in his descriptive lectures on descriptive psychology <coughs> where uh, Brentano takes up the good old idea of Leibniz, namely the idea of a char characteristica universalis. That would be a tool, a universal tool for clarifying our thoughts. And when we have that tool, then we can somehow calculate from the first premises, the first apodictic ap 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 truths of descriptive psychology, how much support we can get from experiences for any particular empirical claim. That's what the characteristic universalis would give you. Uh, you have your first axiom axiomatic ap apodictic truths of <coughs> descriptive psychology, and then you have this characteristically universalis that tells you how the justification uh, spreads out, so to speak, from there to the, to, your, to the rest of your body of beliefs. And here's the surprising alliance that we get here. The empiricist Brentano and the psychologist Brentano uh, now finds himself in an in alliance with a strict anti-psychologist Gottel Frey. They share a common goal. In his uh, remarks on the grief shift, Frey too quotes Leibniz and the idea of a characteristic universalis. So they both were heading for the same goal, namely to provide for philosophy a new foundation, namely a sound foundation by employing new methodological tools by re-inventing uh, this rationalistic theme from Leibniz's characteristic universalis. The big difference between Frege and Brentano was, of course, uh, which kind of tools they used. Uh, Frege used his big riff shift, the purely logical uh, 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 instrument, whereas Brentano thought he could reach the same goal with his descriptive psychology. Why do I call that an illusion? Why is that a grand, a grand illusion? I think that Brentano and uh, both Brentano and Frege with their projects here face a serious uh, objection, namely philosophical problems are not the kind of problems that you can solve in the same way as you can so solve a mathematical problem by an exact proof procedure. So the idea that you can use an exact science, be it uh, uh, an exact uh, uh, logical instrument like the cliff shift or the exact science of descriptive psychology, then to solve, <coughs> to apply that and solve with that instrument <coughs> philosophical problems in the style of a mathematical proof, that's simply an illusion. Philosophical problems are not of that kind. So <clears throat> we can make progress in logic, and Frege made a lot of pro progress in logic uh, by inventing the predicate cal calculus. But that kind of progress isn't transferable <coughs> uh, one by one or immediately to philosophical matters outside of logic. And the same holds for psychology. There's a lot of progress in empirical psychology since the times of Brentano, but it's not obvious how or that this kind of progress can be utilized for making philosophy more scientific or solving philosophical problems. It's the nature of philosophy that doesn't admit of these kinds of secure foundations that Brentano uh, uh, was 